Good evening. My name is Siobhan Shugman. I'm so pleased to be talking with Sadiqa Johnson about her newest book, Yellow Wife, for Greenwich Library's Date with an Author series, and also in celebration of Women's History Month. Welcome, Sadiqa. Thank you so much for having me. Sadiqa Johnson is the award-winning author of four novels. Her accolades include the National Book Club Award, the Phyllis Wheatley Book Award, and the USA Best Book Award for Best Fiction. She is a Cambilio Fellow, a former board member of the James River Writers, and a tall poppy writer. Yellow Wife, which I have a copy of here, um, is Sadiqa's fourth book. It was released in January by Simon & Schuster and has been met with critical acclaim and rave reviews. Congratulations on the book. It was such a fantastic read and I'm so happy I get to talk to you about it today. Okay. Enjoy the book. <laughs> you know, we authors, we spend so much time alone with our writing that when it actually gets out into the world, it's such a good feeling when people say, I liked it, you know? Yes. It was great. I loved it. Um, so I guess just to get started, if you can share a brief synopsis of Yellow White for those that haven't read it yet. Sure. So Yellow Wife is the story of Phoebe Dolores Brown. She is a 17 year old enslaved girl. She lives on a plantation in Charles City, Virginia. She's the daughter of the master of the plantation with his favorite slave, Ruth. Ruth is the medicine woman, the roots woman, and also the seamstress of the plantation. Well, Phoebe has been promised freedom at her 18th birthday. It's something she's known her entire life. Um, she, she was also sort of like the pet to the master's sister who never had children. And he took, she took Phoebe under her arm and taught her how to read and to write and to play piano. Well, a series of events take place and instead of these, this wonderful life that Phoebe had envisioned for herself with her true love, Essex Henry, she finds herself thrust into the bowels of slavery where she ends up at the Lapierre Jail, which is a punishing center and a holding pen for enslaved people. There she catches the eye of the jailer of the, the owner of the jail, and she is forced into many situations where she has to outwit him. She has to make sacrifices, not only for herself, but for also for her children. That was a great description, thank you. Um, before we get too much into the book, I'd love to talk a little bit about your writing career and sort of your journey to where you are today. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. What, how did you know that you wanted to be a writer? Well, I actually wanted to be an actress. Um, I took acting classes as a kid. Even before that, I was, I was really a big reader. So I love libraries. I always have loved the library. As a kid, I had to pass by the library on my way to elementary school. And every Monday I would check out seven books. I read a book a day and um, I was even slipping them behind like my textbooks. I don't know anything that happened in seventh grade math because I was constantly reading like Sweet Valley High, the Sweet Valley High Girls and Judy Bloom. Um, so I was a big reader. I dibbled and dabbled in writing a bit, but I thought that really my calling was that I was gonna be an actress. I went to college in New York City as a theater major, but halfway through I decided, I think I'm gonna to need to get a job once I graduate. So I switched to communications and I got my first job in publishing. So I got to work at Scholastic Books. I was very privileged to work on the first three Harry Potter books. Yeah, which was like, I knew JK Rowling before she was like, JK Rowling, you know? So that was that was a wonderful experience. And other authors like Ruby Bridges and Walter Dean Myers. And then I went on into adult publishing. I went over to Putnam and I was a senior publicist there, publicity manager actually. And I was working with some of the heavy hitters over there too, like Amy Tan and uh, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes and B.B. Moore Campbell. And it was there that I started to realize, working in publishing, I started to realize that I had this calling for writing. So I would write a little bit. Um, I would show a couple of editors some different things that I had done just to get some feedback and get some ideas. Um, I wrote every day on, on the train on my way into the city. And then I would edit my work on the way back. And 
back when I was in publishing, we had these big shared compute, these big shared printers in the middle of the hall where like 17 people shared the printer. So I didn't want my, my colleagues to know that I was working on my first novel. So I would have to rush out to the printer, grab my stuff and then kind of tuck it away. But while I was in publishing, I learned some really valuable lessons. I mean, I was rubbing arms with New York Times bestselling authors and I used that time wisely. I used it to pick their brain and ask them, what's your writing schedule like? You know, um, how did you get started? Where do you get your ideas from? And I was very fortunate. This was pre-coronavirus. We were in, you know, town cars riding with these authors going to Barnes and Noble and Good Morning America and, you know, places like that. So I had a lot of time with them to kind of pick their brain. So that was really the beginning for me. I um, had finished my first novel. I quit my job because I was having a baby. And so I had my son and I thought, okay, well, I've been in publishing, I'm connected. It's gonna be really easy for me to like take care of this baby and put my first novel out. I'll be an instant New York Times bestseller, no problem. Well, things didn't work out that way. <laughs> I got the agent. She did take my book to market, but one by one, every single editor turned my book down. So I was distraught and um, had to figure out what was I going to do? Was I going to quit or was I going to keep going? Well, luckily my husband, he encouraged me to keep going. So we decided to start our own publishing company, 12th Street Press, and we put Love in a Carry-On Bag, my first novel, out ourselves. It was no easy feat, you know, we literally wore all the hats in the publishing. I was on the phone pretending to be the sales manager with a fake name, calling up bookstores saying, you know, hey, would you like this book, Love in a Carry-On Bag? You know, we were going to every book festival up and down the East Coast. Um, I remember going to the Harlem Book Festival and it was like literally 97 degrees outside and I'm sweating my makeup off and I'm, you know, going up to people, trying to get a book in people's hand. And it, it paid off because that day I was able to sell 80 books and it let me know like we were definitely onto something. So that was really the beginning of how things started for me as a writer. That's so interesting. And I mean, such a success story to now be with Simon and Schuster and have this great book. You know, um, the funny thing about being with Simon and Schuster, when I was publishing um, Love in a Carry-On Bag, that was always my benchmark. And I would say, I didn't want people to look at my self-published book and compare it to a Simon and Schuster book. I wanted them not to know what, what which book was which, you know, so that we were seamlessly kind of in alignment with each other. And now Yellow Wife is with Simon and Schuster. It's like I spoke it into existence. And the writing stands for itself. It doesn't matter where it's where it's coming from. It's your it's your writing. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but all of your previous books um, are contemporary fiction, and then obviously Yellow Wife is historical fiction. What drew you to having this historical fiction, and can you talk a little bit about what the differences are in terms of writing those kinds of books? I mean, I imagine it's a pretty big, pretty big difference. Yeah, my first three novels are all contemporary fiction. I was totally writing about things that I knew. My first novel is a long distance love story. My husband and I started off long distance. My second novel, Second House from the Corner, is about a woman who gets married with secrets, but she has these three small children. She's a stay-at-home mom. I was a stay-at-home mom. And then my third book, And Then There Was Me. Um, it's just about things that I knew about, friendship, secrets, and lies. So when I got to, you know, I had no real intention to switch genres. I, I honestly thought I was going to write contemporary fiction and I was searching for another story. We moved to the Richmond area, Richmond, Virginia in 2015. And we had some friends from New Jersey. We lived in New Jersey for 17 years. So um, we had some really close friends come down and we were looking for an activity that we could do with, a, with them and with our kids. And so someone suggested that we take a walk on the Richmond Slave Trail. The Richmond Slave Trail is along the James River and it has 17 different markers. It's about four miles to and from. And as we're walking the trail, the kids are taking turns reading the different markers. And I remember we had gotten to a marker that talked about the Lumpkins Jail and it described it as uh, a punishing center for enslaved people. And it said between 1844 and 1865, over 200,000 enslaved people had passed through the jail. Richmond was number two in the slave trade behind uh, New Orleans. 
And it said that the owner of the jail, his name was Robert Lumpkin. He was known to be notoriously mean and evil and vindictive. And he was even dubbed the bully trader. But what really caught my attention was that it said that he was married to a black woman, a woman named Mary Lumpkin. And my first thought was like, what was it like for her as an enslaved woman to see these people, her fellow enslaved people coming through the jail and their families being separated and them being treated so harshly? What was it like for her? What was it like for her being married to him? Was it a marriage of survival, sacrifice? Was it a marriage of love? And then it said he had, she had, they, together they had these five children. And while he was known, Robert Lumpkins was known as the bully trader, he treated Mary Lumpkin and their five children with compassion. Um, and it said that he took really good care of them. And I just couldn't stop imagining like what it was like for that family, for the children particularly, because a half acre of land is not a lot of space for there to be a jail which you know had the worst smells you know i try and describe it very accurately in the book as a matter of fact a friend of mine said this is the smelliest book i've ever read so i try and get that those smells and that sensory in in the story when i'm talking about the jail but there was a lot going on and there was just something about that story that kind of grabbed hold of my skin so we skipped ahead on the trail and we got to the site of where the lumpkins jail had been and right next to it, there was the African, the sacred African burial ground. When the enslaved people died at the jail, there was no ceremony for them. So they literally just let the bodies pile up, they threw them in the, into the ground, and that was that. Well, as we were walking, we just felt this energy, like you could feel the ancestors in this sacred space. And the feeling was so strong, my friend, he started to pretend like he was playing the African drums. And so we all started moving, the kids started dancing. And it was like this coming home sort of party feeling we were having. And I remember thinking like, wow, it feels like the ancestors were waiting for us. And then I thought, wow, maybe the ancestors were waiting for me. Maybe they want me to tell their story. And so I took all that energy, I went back home and I just started Googling and trying to find everything that I could about the Lumpkins jail, about Mary Lumpkins, about Robert Lumpkins. And the story just wouldn't let me go. So I didn't start, I didn't set off to write a historical fiction novel. It really kind of chose me and I had to say yes to it. That's great. Um, now, in terms, you talked a little bit about all the research that you had to do. How, what did that look like and how long did it actually take you to write the book in terms of, you know, from start to finish with all the research? I researched, so I discovered the story in April of 2016 and I spent the summer probably from April to about September. I always think of September kind of as a new year because my kids are going back to school. So I feel like, okay, you need to be writing something by September. So I spent that time in between going uh, to plantations. Uh, I went to the Library of Virginia and was able to find some periodicals and some books that were written in that time period about Richmond. I was able to find articles on the actual jail um, and different books that you can't find like at, the at a regular libra library. I was able to find at the, the Library of Virginia. Um, and I, I started to world build in a way that I had not had to do for contemporary fiction. So I found pictures and I cut them out and I started this wall in my office so that every time I sat down, I had a, a visual of what the plantation looked like and what I thought Ruth and Phoebe looked like and what the cabins looked like versus the loom house and the smoke house. And then for, for the latter part of the story, when she gets to the jail, I had a picture of the jail. In fact, the picture that, um, is inside Yellow Wife. There's a, the end page is here. This is the actual picture of what the Lumpkins jail looked like. And so I had a picture of this hanging up on my wall so that as I was writing it, I could picture Phoebe moving about on the cobblestone street and what it felt like for her to kind of move about. Uh, so I researched pretty exclusively for a few months and then I started writing. But even when I start writing, I have to flip back and, and research little things like, for instance, the first time Phoebe dressed Mrs. Delfina, who's the mistress of the plantation, I thought, oh my gosh, how many layers does she have on? So I had to go and find, you know, things online that talked about how many layers the women wore in the 1800s and how to, how to string a corset and how tight did it need to be and what it looked like and that sort of thing. So 
while I'm writing, I sometimes get stuck and I'll have to stop and do a quick research and then get back to it. Fantastic. Yeah, one of my comments was about how vivid I felt the descriptions of Richmond especially were. And I was curious, you know, if you, I mean, and you, and you talked, you touched on this a little bit, but, you know, they also went into the church in the city and there was like the cafe. There was definitely a few different locations besides the jail. Were those your own creations or did you find those um, on old maps or how, how did that come to The cafe, I, I made the cafe up. That was definitely um, in my imagination. The actual church in the story, it was the first um, Baptist Church for uh, enslaved and free people in Richmond. Um, and that was the original location of it. The church has since moved since then, but that was the original location. So I did kind of research on what the church looked like. And even the way I described the scene where people sat in the church, I had to kind of figure out like, how did they sit in a church in the 1800s? Did men and women sit together? Did they sit separate? Did families sit together? Um, and it was interesting that I found, even though the church was for Black people, white people also attended the church, which I thought was, um, I, I hadn't known that. So there's a lot of little details about life that I was able to discover in, in, in writing the story. Yeah, I was a little surprised about that when, you know, when they were going to church and there were slaves and white people all kind of together in the same church, which is surprising. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is such a great novel that highlights and spotlights a woman of color um, and you definitely talked already about how, you know, you felt like the ancestors chose you to write the story. Uh, did, was there anything else that you felt some sort of responsibility to bring Mary's story to life, especially in today's climate, with Black Lives Matter, making sure that, you know, people of color are represented in literature? Um, yeah. You know, when I got the call for the story, it was, it was, it was, something that I felt really strongly about that women like Mary, Mary Lumpkins have been blotted from history. I was not able to find a great deal of information on her specifically, but I was able to find information on other women. For instance, Karina Hinton appears in the story and she actually, there was a whole section in one of the historical books that I had read about Karina Hinton and being married to Amohandro and the, the fact that they had a jail together and how she integrated herself in his business so that she wouldn't be tossed aside. So I was able to piece together Mary's story through other women like her, other mulatto women like her who lived in Richmond at that time. And, and I did feel a duty and a sense of pride that I was able to bring light to a woman, a woman who didn't really have a voice, you know? Um, a lot of these women, particularly African-American women uh, in our history, they didn't have a voice. And so I felt, I felt a duty to be able to give voices to our ancestors because I can, you know, I stand on their shoulders, I stand on their backs. If it wasn't for them, you know, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. And so it was definitely a privilege for me to write this story. Now, without, me spoiling too much. I thought one of the most interesting parts of the stories is how you had um, Phoebe's character writing down the stories of every slave that came through the jail. Is is that the reason that you that you had her character do that, or or something? Yeah, it definitely was. And it was something that happened by accident that the journal just appears in the story. You know, sometimes as a writer, I sketch things out, but it's almost like a, a coloring page where I have the outline, but I don't have the colors in the middle of it. And I have to leave space for the characters to tell me what they want to do and for things to just happen organically. And so the diary just organically popped into the story. And so I, I had to figure out like what to do with it. And it, it just happened the very first time she she started to dress one of the fancy girls, it just kind of clicked that Phoebe would be the keeper of the information. Phoebe would give voice to the women who didn't have voices. She would remember that they passed through this place and that they mattered. And that felt good as a writer and that felt good for Phoebe. Yeah, that was a really power, you know, it was a smaller part of the story, but I felt like it was, it was very powerful. Um, now I was wondering why you know, and I think you touched on this a little bit because you mentioned some real life people um, that you did include in the story, but with Mary Lumpkin's character, you made her, you named her Phoebe. 
Um, and you sort of, is that because you just didn't have enough information to keep the name Mary Lumpkin in the story or? I didn't want to dishonor her in any way because a lot, most of the story I made up. So I didn't want to dishonor her in any way. And, and the reason why I kept the other names is because they, they were moving kind of in a smaller role in the story. And so I, I thought it would be okay. But with Mary Lumpkin, um, I just didn't want to dishonor her by saying something that didn't align with who she actually was in real life. Makes sense. Um, then I guess going off of that question, how, how did you pick names for your characters? All of the names in the book um, are people who existed. And that was another way of me honoring the ancestors. So for Phoebe, I was at a plantation here in Charles City, in Charles City, Virginia, called the Shirley Plantation. And in their kitchen, they had the kitchen house was um, on the property. They had a list of enslaved people who had lived at the, who had lived on the property. And I remember, and picking names are, is really a, an, uh, an art for me is I can't just say like Mary, it has to feel like her name is Mary, you know? Um, and so I was fooling around with a lot of different names for Phoebe. And I remember my daughters and I were in the kitchen and I saw the ledger and I looked at it and I saw the name Phoebe with a Y. And just like that, I said, oh, that's it. So that's where Phoebe came from. And her true love, Essex Henry, his name actually came off of my ancestral tree. I have a cousin who was doing our, our family tree and she sent it to me and it went all the way back to the 1700s. So in some cases I would lift names from our family tree, but I would also uh, Google, you can just Google slave ledgers and pictures will pop up, uh, original pictures will pop up and you'll see the, the names of the enslaved people and how old they were and possibly even how much they were bought for, how much they were sold for. And so in a lot of cases, I was able to pull those names and, and honor them by putting their names into the story. And I especially appreciated with Phoebe's character, it was, her name is Phoebe Dolores Brown. And that's definitely called back several times about how she has three names, cause that's, you know, not typical. Um, so I thought that was great. Yeah, Dolores actually, her mother, when that very first scene as her mother calls her and says, come on, Dolores, I just thought, oh, that's how her mother claims her for herself. She doesn't call her what everybody else calls her. She calls her by her middle name. And that just kind of happens serendipitous, serendipitously in the story. Yeah, I like, I definitely like all those little details. Um, now, in doing your research, how did you decide, because after I read the book, I started to do a little bit of research too about the characters because it was just, you know, so interesting. How did you decide what to, what facts to keep in the book and what to just totally create um, in the world yourself? You know, I let the characters lead me. So I bring all the facts, I have them, I weave them in where it feels like it fits. You know, I do like to stay close to the truth but in a way that's gonna create good fiction because I'm a fiction writer and this is a novel. So in the end, it has to sound good as well. So, you know, I weave it in, I take it out, I weave it in and I take it out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the, I think, biggest themes of the book and especially goes along with, you know, celebrating Women's History Month is that the book is full of these incredibly strong female characters, you know, Phoebe, of course, but then there's also Ruth, her mother. Um, and a lot of times they made their decisions based on their children. And that was like their major motivation in life. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? You know, why, why did you take the, the novel in that direction? Yeah, the novel, the, the story of strong women is what I just love to write about. So through all four of my novels, you're gonna see strong women characters and there's gonna be a strong feeling of love. Uh, man, woman love, motherhood love, like I love writing about love. The mothers in the story, Ruth was such an interesting character, Ruth being Phoebe's mother, because she, sacrifice so much for Phoebe, you know, her relationship with, with the master, Master Jacobs was for Phoebe, you know, she spent Phoebe's whole life trying to prepare her to be free. You know, she told her you're a slave in mine, but you're, you're a slave 
in body, but never in your mind. And it was something that she had said to her over and over and over again, because she wanted her to know that, that the only thing holding you back is this, is this, this plantation. But once you leave here, go and live your life, you know? Um, so motherhood had a strong feeling. Ruth was near and dear to my heart because of her being a medicine woman. And, you know, I always feel like if I had been born in a different time period, maybe I would have been like the roots person or the medicine person. I can't, cure anybody right now, but I, I would like to think that that would be my job. Um, I also love that she was a, a midwife. And so that's something else that I think, oh, wow, that would be so interesting for me to take up, you know? So I live vicariously through my characters. I have three children myself and I'm every day, you know, making sacrifices for, for the betterment of them. You know, moms, we move into different neighborhoods so that they can go to the best schools and that sort of thing. And so it was very easy for me to string that in the story. You know, all I had to do was look into my own heart and I gave Phoebe and her mother and all the strong women just my own feelings as they moved through the story. Yeah. Um, yeah, th those characters were fantastic. And then you had also like this, the smaller characters that even though they might not have been Phoebe's mother or any of, or Phoebe's children's mother, but they all sort of took this, it was very community um, oriented that they sort of all raised the children together, which was, which was great. Um, did you, maybe your answer is Ruth since you just sort of talked about it, but besides Phoebe, is there a particular character you felt connected to or enjoyed writing the most? I will say, and this is gonna surprise you. While I loved, I loved all my characters to be quite honest. I would say one that surprised me that I enjoyed was Mrs. Delfina. Um, you know, she's a little bit of the villain in the story, so it's very easy to dislike her. But I had to really get inside of her head to make her three dimensional so that she wouldn't just be kind of flat on the page and be stereotypical, right? Because that's what you think of when you think of a white mistress. She doesn't like her black slave, particularly when they are, you know, close to the master. And so I had to really go behind, pull back the layers so that I could understand her. I remember reading uh, one of the historical books that I was researching and it talked about white women on these plantations and how they felt. And one of the things was that they felt isolated. You know, it wasn't often that they had come in contact with women who were like them, other white women. Um, they were often jealous because their, their husband was sleeping with some of his slave women and sometimes would prefer the slave woman over, over her. And so she was a regular woman, just like you and I, with those type of emotions. And, you know, one time in the book, she says, this plantation has robbed me of my beauty. She wanted to be beautiful, just like the rest of us, you know? And so getting in her head and figuring out who she was as a woman and why she did the things she did was very, very interesting for me as a writer. That's a very interesting answer. And that sort of goes into my next question because you, you know, she was sort of the villain or one of the villains, certainly. Um, and you made her into this three-dimensional character. And then my next question was about the Reuben Lapier character because, you know, he's just described as this vile human being, like you said, the bully trader. But you you did sprinkle in the book a little bit of of his compassion and love for his family. And I thought that was such an interesting take. You could have just made him, you know, the most evil man, but you kind of you sprinkled in some other details too. Um, the most difficult character to write, I would say for that reason. Um, in my research on him, the thing that attracted me to him to begin with, that it, that he appeared to be a man with two faces. While on the one hand, he was evil and vindictive, as you mentioned, but on the other hand, he was tender and compassionate towards his family. And so how to merge that together, you know, it took drafts. It definitely took drafts for me to get that. And I had to kind of toe the line of, you know, his tenderness versus his, his ability to be very, very evil. Um, so that was, he was definitely the most difficult character for me. And it took probably until I got to maybe about the fifth or sixth draft for me to really see him stand up on the page. Um, in terms of how you had to write his character, there he was a part of a lot of the more violent, brutal scenes in the book. Uh, were those difficult to write or did you sort of separate yourself from it? 
They were difficult to write, but the way I prepared myself for the scenes was that if our ancestors could live them, I could surely humble myself enough to be able to write it. And that was really my approach. When I was writing the story, I was looking at the difference between the way his, historians wrote about this period in our history versus reading books by enslaved people, reading their personal narratives. And when I read their personal narratives, like Incident in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacob and 50 Years a Slave by Charles Ball, I was up close and personal in, in their day-to-day -day life. And that's the way I wanted you to feel as you were reading Yellow Wife. Um, I didn't want you to feel like you had that historical film kind of in between you, like me telling you the story. I wanted you to feel like you were in the story. And that was a conscious choice that I, I made because I felt like we owe, we owe it. As, as readers and me as a writer to the people who this is, has, has really happened to, for us to kind of acknowledge that it happened, you know, and, and, and be, you know, not, not shy away from the fact that this is part of our American history. That's great. Um, you know, you mentioned some of the, of those slave narratives that you, that you read in preparing for this novel. Um, I guess if people are interested in learning more about, you know, Richmond slave trading and slavery in general, uh, or books that you found particularly um, well done when you were doing your research, is there anything you would recommend to readers after, after they read Yellow Wife? If you go to my website, sadiquajohnson.net, I have a whole page uh, and it says for book clubs, but it's for anybody who wants to read the book. Um, I give kind of a, a list of books that I read that inspired the story. Um, and the books, the books that I read is, are also in the author note at the back of the book. And it kind of details certain scenes I actually did, uh, some of those difficult scenes that you talked about that uh, Ruben was kind of the jailer was in the middle of, some of those scenes actually came from books that I had read. And so I talk about that a little bit in the author's note at the back of the book. Great. Um, and I guess to go back a little bit to just your, your writing, do you have any authors that you look up to and following up that, any advice for aspiring writers? You know, I look up to any author who I'm reading in the moment who really just makes my, my heart sing, you know? When I read a book, I, it has to do two things for me. It has to entertain me, but it also has to teach me about craft. You know, because otherwise it's, it's just entertainment for me. I would say um, growing up, one of the first writers who really touched my heart was Terry McMillan. Reading her first novel, Mama, was the first time that I actually saw myself on the page. And, you know, I turned around and read the book a second time. When I read Maya Angelou's autobiographies, I felt the same way. And when I read Zora Neale Hurston, Their Eyes Were Watching God, those are books, you know, that that touch my soul. Now I would say, as of recently, I I read, read uh, The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, which is phenomenal. I learned so much about craft and I was so drawn into the story. You know, I was so inspired by her. I also just finished uh, The Alice Network by Kate Quinn, which I was completely blown away with the way she told the story, you know. Um, so I'm often, I'm often, there's always another writer that I'll, I'll read and I go, oh my gosh, you know, Diane McKinney Whetstone is a Philadelphia author and she wrote a book called, she wrote a lot of books that I loved, but Lazarado was one that took place in the 1800s. And I had read that book and I was so, like I was studying it, not, not realizing that I was studying it, preparing myself to write Yellow Wife because I hadn't even gone on the slave trail at that point. But I remember studying the way she told that story and just thinking about it like, wow, maybe I could write a story that took place before I was born because that was my big hang up. How could I write a story about something that happened before I was even thought about, you know, generations before. But, but authors like that kind of inspire me to just give it a try. And the, the second question was, uh, um, any advice to aspiring writers? My biggest advice is keep your butt in the chair. I mean, that is the easiest thing I can tell you. Don't um, feel like you need to quit your job to write your novel. Just start with 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes a day quickly leads to 20 minutes. 20 minutes is 30 minutes. And before you know it, you're writing an hour a day. 
Um, my biggest thing is distractions. I have to literally write down the time I sit down to start writing. I have to decide in the morning how long I'm going to write today. And I have to write the time down. I have to clock in and clock out to keep myself from being distracted. So find something that works for you. Find some sort of accountability for yourself. Schedule your writing time the same way you would a doctor's appointment and be intentional about it and, and stick with it. Don't let the story die inside of you. Now, I know you mentioned that you talk to book clubs a lot. Um, I guess putting you on the spot a little bit, have, have there been any opinions about the book that like just totally surprised you or like questions that you thought, well, like that's just, you know, the most interesting like question or commentary about it? Anything what call, I, come to mind? Well, what I like about meeting with book clubs is that sometimes they, they give me credit for things that I had not intended, but just kind of work. You know, sometimes they'll ask me questions like, did you realize that you were, how did you come up with? And I'm thinking, oh, wow, I, I don't even remember. Like, I don't think I did that. I think it just happened in the story. Uh, so talking to book clubs is always am amazing. So far, so good. Everybody has been so warm and supportive of Yellow Wife. All of the, the questions and comments have been really, really lovely. That's great. Well, well-deserved too. Uh, is there anything you can talk about that you're working on now or are well, you working I, on anything now? <laughs> I am. Listen, I got to keep the momentum going. Um, I am working on a fifth novel. It is also another historical fiction. I've gotten bitten by the bug. And so I'm really um, into this now. So this story actually takes place in the 40s and the 50s, 1940s, 1950s. Um, I can tell you that it's the story of two strong women who have to overcome some really hard choices. That, that's usually the thing that I like to write about. Um, and their lives intertwine. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of it. That's all I got for you now, but, but stay tuned. I think it's gonna be a good one. I'm really enjoying the 40s and the 50s, getting to know, uh, it takes place in Philly and DC. I grew up in Philadelphia, so it's interesting for me to go back into Philadelphia and look at what it was like in the 50s um, and just kind of get a feel for how people moved and what they, how they spoke and what they wore and how they moved through the story, you know, how men courted women, like all of that is just really at the, at the heart of my research right now. That's great. And yeah, that's, that's such a departure from this. It's a totally different time. So it's historical fiction, but you know, a whole nother another world. I needed a break. I'll, I'll be honest. A lot of people have been asking me for a sequel to Yellow Wife, which I am so honored that people loved it so much that they want to see a second book. But for me, for now, I just need to kind of take a break. It was hard to spend three years in, you know, such a difficult part of our American history. Uh, so I needed to come out of it and, and do something different. But I'll, I'll never say never. We'll see. I've never written a sequel but I never wrote historical fiction before either. So we'll see. And it, the, you know, without saying anything, the ending does leave it, leave it open to, to do a sequel for sure. I always leave some threads and strings uh, in all of my books in case I do want to go back and write a sequel. I always leave some, some, some room for that for myself. Well, this has been so great getting to chat with you about the book. I wish I could ask even more questions, but I feel like I would spoil the story for, for our readers. Um, but, you know, it's been so great talking with you. And I just need to thank the Greenwich Library Board of Trustees that helped make these programs possible. And for anybody watching, we do have copies of Yellow Wife available, both digitally and in print at the library. So we can, you can definitely get those, go get those copies. And I highly recommend reading it. Yellow Wife. <laughs> Thank you, Sidiqua. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure.